So let's talk about week 12 to start with. And so historically, I had this list up from 2018. And if you go into our, into our Blackboard shell, you can see the list from 2018. And, and people apparently in 2018 were really dumb, right? Number one password of all the passwords going through, and this was through a company called Nord. They do a lot of research, and they have a password manager. So there is a little bit of influence that they are trying to peddle. But, huh, one, two, three, four, five, six, password. Oh, oh, but, oh, oh, sunshine. So that was new in 2018. I love you. Oh. Admin, six, 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 sixes. Huh. Do any of those look secure? No. But it's 2021. We've survived a pandemic. We're going to have better lists, right? So down at the bottom of your screen, ah, ah crap. But picture one is new. We have a new one. But it, uh, it's not very secure either. But what's even worse, out of the password places that they have grabbed passwords from stolen accounts, two and a half million people used one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh my goodness. One, two, three, four, five, six. But it's better because they went to all the way to eight, right? So. It doesn't seem like people are getting the message. Great. So passwords are, they, they don't seem to be working. So my thought was, well, maybe there's not enough high stakes in there because these people are pulling them from like Yahoo emails breach. Well, we know, you know, Yahoo, who cares about their Yahoo mail, right? So let's take a look at what people do when it's a little more high stakes. Ah. So several years ago, there was a website that lost all of their usernames and passwords. And that website was something called Ashley Madison. And I know that none of you are on this, because I don't think any of you are married, right? Got it. So this is a site that says, Hey, if you're married, we want to help you cheat, right? You'd think, man, if I'm going to cheat on my spouse, I'm probably going to use a really secure password. Now, beyond the obvious of hopefully you don't want to cheat on your spouse, but clearly some people are not as great as you are. Let me get rid of the junk spam pop-ups here. So we go to Ashley Madison and we look and see what their best passwords were and well, crap. But QWERTY, oh yeah, you type the letters on the top. I like that they had to censor one of the passwords even. So not only are you a, a dirtbag because you're willing to cheat on your spouse, but apparently you're not very bright about what password you're using, along with when they found this, what's, what's kind of interesting is how many people used their work emails or government emails or the best ones, the church emails to do that. So in this password dump from Ashley Madison of 11 million passwords, that frightens me that there's 11 million people willing to go onto a site and cheat on their spouse. But we'll digress from that. Of those, 120,000 people thought 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 was a good password. And these are your coworkers, your bosses, the people that work for you, the people around you, the people at your church. And we think, wow, maybe passwords aren't really great. What else can we do? So passwords are, are in our life. Unfortunately, we can't get rid of them quite yet. But even better, if I say, well, you know, maybe I want to buy some passwords. 
And so there are companies like this one. This, this website will actually sell you the password to any one of these 3,000 plus different breaches. They'll sell you the password and the username together. Huh. Great. And if I look at this, you can find all different kinds of websites and places that have gotten hacked. And they're all for sale. All of them for sale. But, but usually they're small password hacks, right? We haven't, we haven't had any recent data breaches that you guys have heard about, have you? No? Well, let's do a little digging. So... So the same site that I made you go to, this Have I Been Pawned, well, they pull data, and he's a legitimate researcher, although he's also selling a product. Huh. April 2021, Facebook. But it's a minor number, right? 509 million Facebook users? Oh, crap. Well, luckily it's just, just, just Facebook. Nobody else has been added in there. Well, Astoria, oh, which you don't necessarily directly deal with, but they're an ad agency that grabs data about you. Well, the, oh, 11 million. Website called Liker, another social media. So, no, that's that's okay. That's that's, that's only 465,000 accounts listed. Travel Oklahoma. We're still in March. They lost 637,000 records. Okay. Well, Oxfam, that's Oklahoma or uh, Australia. We don't care about that. Dutch ticketing, we don't care. So some of these, oh, nurserycam.com. Oh, well, that's probably not good. People's Energy in, in the UK, that's, you know, small numbers. So, obviously, it's a worldwide issue. I have a username and password that got hacked off of this site, Nitro. I like their software. Apparently, I don't like their uh, security system. So, Nitro is an alternative PDF creation tool, and it actually works very really well, but they lost 70 million plus email addresses and records. Crap. All right. Well, who would ever go to a job site online? You know, so, and we're just back to January on this one site, and they don't have every one of those giant data breaches. If I add those up, we're at a billion records plus floating around out there. So, my guess is when you started putting in your information for this assignment this week, you had been at some point one of your email accounts was been owned somebody has gotten a hold of it great so there are some interesting things that you can do in here so the ashley madison passwords they don't list them here but you can go find them on the world wide web if you're curious go look at how many of those are .gov or .mil or .edu accounts that were that were revealed in there that people were using people aren't very smart and you think well we're smart down here right we're smart in oklahoma or in, in omaha area and we're smart in in nebraska we're smart in iowa and then we look and see what has happened even around here and we go man maybe maybe we don't need computers maybe they're not very smart because we don't seem to do a really good job with them so we need to come up with some ways to do with to deal with that so how do I give people access how do I say you know what you need access to certain items how do I exclude other items and so we need some basic rules so so I need this idea of access control who do I give access to what do I give them access to so physical access so I have a key to the building, technical access, so I can get into the computer, but it won't let me access certain records. So are my PSC, 
there are certain things that you guys can get into your accounts with. You can see all of your financial aid information. When I log into my PSC, I can see the list of classes you've taken, the classes that you're enrolled in, the classes in your shopping cart, but I can't see anything about your financial aid. And that's actually a really good thing. We want to keep that private. So I have access to my PSC, but I'm limited in what I can do. So how do we say you are the person that we want in there? So a couple of terms, identification. So in other words, we like the idea of if you're a UPS employee. All right, that's my identification. I've got a badge. I've got a my PSC card. I have something that says this is who I am. Authentication is that term of saying I'm checking those credentials. I'm checking your password. I'm checking you. I'm checking however we're logging into this system. So authentication is checking that credentials. Authorization then is giving you permission. So you drive up to Cooper, you get up to the gate, authentication, they check your license, authorization, they let you in or stop you at that point. And then on the back end is we need some record of who goes in and out of these areas and in and out. So those records management get to be pretty important. So similar thing. Here we just go through it as a scenario and then as a computer so you can see kind of the difference. So user only allowed to access specific information. Accounting, we record everything in some kind of a log file so that we can go back and verify who does what. Well, we have some other terms. So a specific item or resource we tend to just call an object. And that object could be physical, could be exist only on the computer, it could be a, a specific file. Operation, that ability to manipulate that file. So earlier we talked about one of the worst things that we have happen is a user accidentally or maliciously deletes files. Well, now we have a log of it. And in most cases, what we actually do is we use this process to keep you from ever deleting files. So most people, you can create a file, you can read a file, you could update it, but you lose that ability to delete it unless you're the owner of that object. And then in our companies, now granted a lot of this is, a, is set for a scale of a much bigger company. And it's one of those areas where small companies struggle because we don't have somebody who works just security or just privacy or HIPAA compliance if you're in a medical setting or all these different roles, it gets shoved down to one or two people and that makes it a little more difficult. So privacy officer, sometimes you have that person or a role that says, I know who needs access to what in our MyPSC system. So I can't see things like your financial aid information, or what you currently owe, but I can see that you've got a, a hold on your account for failing classes last semester. So somebody who can check the boxes and say, this is what you need. You have somebody that's in charge of doing that. So I've been given the instructions, I know the rules, that's somebody who implements them. Our end user, well in this case they're opening up a file called salary it's an Excel file, and the owner. So the owner generally is the one who creates it or has some ownership of that file. So they may send it to the privacy officer and say, hey, I think we need to talk about what, who can open the salary for the company file. And it depends on what kind of company you're at. So we'll make fun of Cooper out here. Cooper, being a publicly owned company, can you look up the salary of any employee out there? Yeah. Oh. Can you look up the salary of what I make here? Yeah. It takes a little more effort because we hide some of ours. that You had to go through some minutes of the board meetings. But if you guys want to find out what I made last year, you can figure it out pretty easily. Yeah. 
It's, on the other hand, if I'm a private company, those salaries are held pretty tightly usually. And in fact, a lot of companies have policies saying you're not allowed to discuss with your coworkers what you're making. Because you might find out that you're making eleven fifty an hour and they're making twelve and they just got hired. So we try to departmentalize these things and we try to give you rights only as needed or as much as possible. So here's that example again, but now it shows different people in there. So in our world, we have a lot of different models. And so models come about a company or an organization has developed something, and they say, we think this works. So in our book, they actually have five listed. There are far more than that. But these kind of give us a flavor of those ideas. And they really go from that idea of least convenient to most convenient in some ways. You might want to think about them on that spectrum. So. This idea of discretionary access control is our least restrictive model. So in other words, you typically get all the rights unless we specifically exclude you from it. So owners have total control over objects. So owners get to hand off those permissions. So if I'm just in Windows, I can say, hey, everybody can have access to this file, or nobody can. So the end user has to set security, and we have this inheritance problem. So anything that spawns off of that file inherits the same permissions. Well, you can see it here even, even in Windows here. That's an example of a picture file. And we're saying everybody has permissions, so full control means they can modify, read, write, and delete, and everything in there. So this idea of discretionary access control says, Everybody can do that. The opposite side, the opposite side it typically is something called mandatory access control. So everybody has no freedom. So it is the most restrictive. Until you are explicitly granted permission for an object, you don't have the ability to access this. So since we have a, an Air Force veteran in the class, I'll use them as an example. In the military and highly secure organizations, this is kind of a, one of the models that they use. You don't get permission until it's given to you specifically for one individual item. It's, it's, a, it's kind of the opposite side of this. So it's very inconvenient. So we use classification labels. You can you can say that certain people have different ranks and different rules and different permissions, but it's each item individually. So we look at it. There's a lot of different sub-models of this. We're not going to hang up on a lot of details on, on the models, but Windows does have the ability to use part of this or something closer to Mac. So one of the things, that, but we tend to just ignore it, is one of the features in there is something called user access control. So when I go to install a piece of software on my computer, it pops up a box and says, hey, do you really want to do that? Well, sure, I started it. That can be a very useful tool. So on a Linux system, we have something called sudo, where we have to log in specifically as a root. On Windows, we give everybody root access all the time, so it's a lot less user friendly. So, in this case, we keep very good records of who accesses what. So, this is that example of that UAC in, in Windows. Well, in this case, it just says yes. If you're on a domained computer, typically you have to log in with an account that has administrative rights on that particular machine. So we can expand it out a little bit, but you're only allowing people access on a specific item. So there's also some other ones. So role-based means we put users into specific roles, and those roles give us permissions for different areas. So very similar to what we do here, as a role of faculty, that tells me what permissions I get inside of my PSC. 
if I'm a role of admin assistant. So I, I've moved down in the office and I'm helping out people. I have a different set of rules. They can access things like classroom management tools that I'm not allowed to see or do. And it's based on that user's role and, that, and how they're assigned. So it's a little easier. So we have then this attribute based. So attribute based gives us some, some additional granularity in there. So here I have my role. I'm a faculty person, but maybe I can actually do it only when I'm geofenced in here. And I have some other attributes. Or I can only look at financial aid information if I'm in the financial aid office. Well, then you can't access that remotely. So we can do some of those things to try to make these rules not just one size fits all. And in fact, you can even have some, some rules that will go in there like that. So this is kind of a shortcut. So most flexible, most restrictive, least restrictive. Role-based is kind of the thing we do a lot of. So is there a perfect system? No. We take all take options through almost everything and we try to make these as user friendly as possible so when we onboard somebody we have to create them as an account on our system or when somebody moves from one role to another in a company we have to migrate them that's part of this not as fun but writing the documentation, ensuring that these are procedures and policies and they're, and they're considered. But we have a lot of other things that we don't even think about on accounts. Accounts for the uh, copiers. So the copiers, in many cases, sign in through the Active Directory system. We have to create accounts for those. Any external vendors that we communicate. If we use tools like, I'm trying to think what the name of the one that you guys use now for uh, tracking similar to Spiceworks, but there's a lot of other ones. Any of those kind of remote monitoring tools, they're going to have accounts. So how do I set all those up so I have a policy and procedure? One of the problems we have when we do this is we need to think about those restrictions based on that role, based on that person. Things like standard naming conventions. So Standard naming conventions in a company are pretty important. Everybody is first initial, last name at, unless you're the students here, and then you get this long, gigantic email address or an account. I know. I, I had, I thought there were better, but whatever. Um, I, won't, I won't whine about that. But how do we enforce least privilege? What about time of day restrictions? So one of the things a lot of companies have actually done is put time of day restrictions into things like copiers even. That copier can't be activated after like 6 o'clock. Why do we do that? So that somebody doesn't come in the office and print out 6,000 pages of the school flyer and run up the copier cost. Or somebody can't sneak in the office because they've broken in and you left your monitor on and didn't log out of those accounts, and hey, now I'm into the, the payroll system. And I just added a new employee, and it's me. And I make $42 an hour, and I just worked 45 hours this week. So when we onboard somebody, we bring them on board, there's some things we have to do. We know we have to train them and all these other things, but typically on a Windows environment, we have to give them something to use, and we have to create their, their profile on the system we have to tell it where it's stored in your folders. On most corporations, and Peru being a e weird example, if you're storing documents, they're not stored on your own computer. They're typically pointed to somewhere in the server stack so that it looks like they're on your desktop, but they're actually backed up and protected. And that way, if you wipe out your computer, so be it. Here, because we have some weird restrictions based on people and their ideas of what they think they have for rights as a faculty to create anything they want, 
that doesn't always happen. In fact, I don't think it happens much at all, honestly, unfortunately. But it's actually a really good thing. We go through, we onboard them, we bring them on board, and we say, great. Now we have a new employee, they're ready to work. Until tomorrow when we fire them. Huh. There's a lot of reasons people need to be off-boarded. So, can I be fired? Yeah. The proverbial, I've stepped out in front of the bus, it happens, unfortunately. People do pass away. People quit. People just decide, you know, I'm not going to show up tomorrow. Okay. So, what do we do? First thing, we need to remove their access from entering that system, especially if they've got remote access in any kind of form. Make sure we get that turned off. So, typically for HR, we'll back up all of their files. So their, their files and their emails are all backed up and archived. Well, we do that, again, kind of as that protection. How do I, how do I protect my, myself and my company? So we take them out of the address books, and we typically have their email coming in, and we forward it to wherever it should go. That way, there's a continuity of business. So this should be, sounds like a really easy thing to do, but even around here, the number of times I've walked into a business and found out that there is not this process in place, people have had access for months, if not years afterwards, it's pretty sad. And part of that is there's always seems to be a disconnect between human resources and IT, the departments, for whatever reason. Very, very common. I got involved many, many years ago. We, we ended up having to fire an employee. And I got brought in as a consultant because I could be the bad person then, so it wasn't you know anybody else. Well, this particular individual had essentially decided that they were going to retire in place. So one of the challenges from a human resource point was, this guy is over 55 years old, but he wasn't doing anything. And so we actually established some new procedures and some new policies, and he decided to not cooperate with them. So we made a, a training requirement that you had to go out and get a couple certificates and a training plans, and he decided not to do that. So on the basis of those grounds, we actually terminated him. However, However, HR was all good about that because they'd wanted to fire this guy for years because I don't know what the problem was. But When I went back a couple weeks later to see how it went, he still had not been taken out of the system. He had, he had remote access into all of their servers. And thank goodness that he decided not to go in and just delete every piece of information at this medical facility. Great. And he was still sending emails out on his email account. Really wasn't sure he'd been fired. Now, he also then sued us for, not me personally, luckily, but he sued them for age discrimination in his firing. And it, what they ended up doing was they settled with him for, I believe, about $50,000 because it was cheaper than going to court. It happens. So those employees that we get rid of through any means, we need to make sure that there is a process in place where the day that they're let go, or even sometimes earlier, they're, they're moved off the accounts. So we don't want to destroy their data because there may be some reason they're being fired. Maybe they've been embezzling. We certainly don't want to delete everything if they've been embezzling. So we need to think about that. How, what is our process for that? Do we have a yearly check through or six months where we look for orphaned or dormant accounts. People aren't using them. Why aren't you using the company email? And that might reveal some interesting answers about, well, our company email address sucks, so I just send everything to my Gmail. And if, if I'm your boss, my head just exploded, right? Because in a lot of industries, I have to track your email, have it retained for a certain amount of time, and it's subject to things like discovery, and you've just taken it outside the woodshed out here and said, I'm going to put it out here in the porta pot where it's no longer protected by any of those rules. And in some cases, if you're, for example, a financial advisor or in the securities industry, that could be an event that triggers a, a very large fine. So those kinds of things become important. How do we look at employees? So 
We do want to keep data from people that are, that are gone. Sometimes lawsuits go on far longer than you would imagine. So in the state of Nebraska, just to kind of give you an idea about how long sometimes people can sue, my stepdaughter Hannah graduated, well, she's 25 now, so seven years ago, whenever it was, from, and she was a senior in high school and got involved in a small accident. Person in front of her stopped, she didn't see him, bumped their bumper, and her insurance at that point paid out about $1,000. A little over four years after that, we got a notice from the insurance company. So, huh, we're four years later. She's not on our insurance anymore. She's out on her own. Got a letter that, hey, there's been a lawsuit filed against you. So they waited until the very last minute, and they filed a lawsuit. And it wasn't a huge one. They filed a lawsuit for, I believe it was $55,000 for future medical and other issues. Now, in this time, they'd never been to the doctor. They'd never done anything else. But legally, they were allowed to file, and they filed a couple of days before the four-year expiration, and then it was another four or five months before the insurance company even notified us that they had been filed on it. So it was four and a half years later we found out we're being sued. So those records are important. Keep them that long. If you have an employee that did something, even if they didn't do anything, keep them for that long because it's kind of embarrassing to go to the judge and say, well, we couldn't get any of those records. We, we done destroyed them. The flip side of that is this, I, I will say. I would also think about asking a legal entity to come up with part of your policy and think about what and how long you need to archive those and not archive them any longer than necessary. Because in a court case, it may be in your advantage if those records are actually gone, making sure you follow the rules of the game. So each state is different. So you need to make sure, and sometimes entities so related to taxes might be different than entities related to human resources. So this is one of those areas where, dang it, we've got to drag in the lawyers and they've got to make some money and, and we can figure out our, our policies. But once we create those, we need to make sure that they are done correctly. So We talked a little bit about geofencing the other day, and we said that's that idea that now almost everything has a a GPS attribute. So if I log into my phone and I look at a picture, I can see the exact location it was taken. It's got a geo reference in it. Well, because all these devices have GPS, I can actually find out where my items are and I can draw fences around them. And I can say, well, great, you can only, this computer will only work if it's in this general area. So if I have a lot of theft of items, and I know that they're going across the national border. So we're up by Canada, and they're crossing into the Canadian system. We could geofence them so that they no longer work after that. So it can also be used for those authorization requests. Sometimes it can be really sneaky. Hey, I see you're at the library, not at work. Why are you trying to log into your work computer? Well, I, um, um, um. Now, in a lot of cases, our work has shifted where you don't have to be there physically, but it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, and these can add a lot of usefulness to that. So, standard naming conventions. So typically, it's first initial, last name, with or without a punctuation mark. So some companies do you know, like R dot Dennis, some do R Dennis, some will do the include the in first entire name. So we do have to come up with a, a system where we deal with a couple of issues. One of them is, what if we have two Brad Smiths or John Smiths or Mary Kate Smith or whatever? We need to come up with that. We also need to come up with a provision for if people change their names, how it resolves back to the original one in some cases. How do I do that if I have multiple names very similar? So we need to be sure on our naming conventions that it makes sense. And so one thing I will say with our naming convention for students 
we're not going to have a conflict, right? But we've also got it fairly unwieldy where it's not necessarily a useful vanity email. So you'll see those different standards. Different companies have standards. But even from a standpoint, I want to get a hold of somebody at, at Corporation XYZ, and I see one person's address as like B Nye. I have a general idea. Hey, I can get a hold of Chuck Smith by doing csmith at xyz.com. So those standards are kind of nice. So in one particular location, I saw what happened that looks very dumb. So if you go to Nemaha County Courthouse and you start looking up their email addresses, they're actually on two different formats. Because one group wanted one corporation email, and another group of individuals in the departments wanted a different one. So there's actually two different email address standards, depending on which department you work in, in the same county for 15 emails or whatever there are. Oops. So be, a, be aware of some of those kinds of things when you're, when you're looking at them. All right, we'll leave you with this idea of this time of day. So time of day can do a lot of things. I, can, I know that my employees are typically here at certain hours. So can it be an inconvenience if you decide to work late till 7? Yeah. So if you're typically a user that works till 7, we're going to set that so that you can work till 7. But I don't have any employees working overnight, so I can turn off access to different files, and I can change that for different locations. It doesn't have to be the entire company. Because we do know that we have companies that work worldwide and with the times. So this restriction can actually be a good thing, but I have to be flexible in it and say, all right, oh, I know that, that Amy's got to come in at 3 in the morning for a conference called India. So she needs access to these files. So we need a procedure that you can change this fairly rapidly if you need to. But it is useful. There are times when we turn off things. So when they can log into account, when Wi-Fi is available, so there's an example of Wi-Fi and very similar things. There's a, a library I do a little, a little assistance with. And one of the issues they had was not saying that there's some drug trade in this general southeast Nebraska area. But in the summers, this library would actually have people sitting outside on their tablets, on their Kindle, on whatever device they had at 3 or 4 in the morning while they're doing drugs and making drug deals. And so to actually get them to migrate a little bit, we turned off Wi-Fi. Same kind of access restrictions, but we shut it off at certain times. There's not much legitimate need for Wi-Fi in a library at midnight. And I saw the logs of where they were going. It was pretty creepy. So we can use those restrictions to make our environment a little, little more friendly. All right. So this week, I get back to that. So this week there are a couple of lab simulations for you to do. So folder ownership, managing security. There is a quiz. And there's lots of password information in there. And then there is a discussion board. So in this case, what we're looking for is you can grab anything, recent security issue, and tell me about it. So link to the original post, paraphrase what happened and why you think it happened. And so we want to look at some of those and say, could this have been prevented easily? And so I've got one I'm going to bring into class probably next week because it fits some of our other content. And I think it will, it will frighten you. And it's in a small town not too far from here. And it goes back to some of these areas where I think are, are very, very scary. So pick anything. Find one. Find one recent. So uh, honestly, there are so many. You can do one in 2021. 2020, you could find one. If you're going back to 2014, that's probably been pushed over the edge a little bit, so don't go back that far. So something recent. 
Something that may apply to you. You guys may have gotten in some kind of an email or something recently about an account. So tell me about the breach, what happened. Paraphrase the article. Make sure you link to it. All right, any questions? Anybody asleep? <laughs> <laughs>